Hi, welcome to this lecture on environmental adaptation of animals. Now we will start to think that, okay, what happens on ectothermic animals when the environment is frozen? So how they can keep the body unfreeze, unfrozen when the body temperature is below zero? We have places like Arctic and Antarctic where the temperature hardly ever rise above zero degrees of Celsius. And of course, the first thing that okay comes in the mind that okay, in the Antarctica there's no life at all, but actually there exist. There is about one thousand species living even on the continent of Antarctica, and majority of these are invertebrates and ectotherms. So they must have some kind of mechanisms to live with very cold body. And even in Finland, that is less extreme, so we can have minus 40 degrees of Celsius at winter time, and we have ectotherms that are not migrating to the south, so they must, at least in some form, either on eggs or larvae or adults, they can sur must survive throughout the winter. Well, why can't the animals just freeze and thaw? The problem is that, okay, if you freeze your cells, you will die. The melting point of water is zero, and the melting point of your body fluids is around the zero because we have a little bit salt there, so the osmolality is about 0 0.3 uh, osm, a milliosm or osm per gram. So it will melt on that te temperature, but if we cool down, for example, water bottle fast, it will be super cooled. So the temperature of liquid water temporarily can be far below the melting point. And it depends on the rate of the freezing, so how fast we will decrease the temperature. And it can last all the way till supercooling point, where there will be very fast ice formation, and it's completely uncontrolled. If you have a water bottle, it can freeze within seconds if it's super cold. And okay. The melting point and the freezing point are not always exactly the same. And the difference between the supercooling point and the melting point is called thermal hysteresis. And that's why it's affected on, on how fast you will get frozen, that okay, will you survive or not. If you will be frozen too slowly, you will die. If it's too fast, you will die also. And that happens also in, for example, cultured cells, when you are putting them in the liquid nitrogen to store them. If it happens too fast, they will die. The problem is a little bit different in the slow and fast freezing. The slow freezing happens also in the wild nature, and the problem exists in the membrane lipids and cell volume, ion activities and distribution. But then in the fast freezing, we have a supercooling related damages. So there will be ice inside the cells, and ice can even move through the membranes, and if you break the membrane you will destroy the cell and the ice can be formed in, inside the water channels even, and that will break quite much the, the channel structure. So you have two different kind of problems. So either on the cell volume or on the ice itself. Okay, what happens in the wild nature, in the slow freezing? The problem is that when you have ice, for example, in the extracell solution, there is less space for the, all the particles that are diluted in this 
solution. So that's why the concentration of these uh, of the wa uh, water molecules, free mo water molecules, is different from the inside and outside. And that's why the water is moving, tra is transported through the membrane, so with, with these white, white, these white water channels, etc. And this movement of water then affects that, okay, the cells are either swelling or shrinking, depending on which side you have the eyes. And usually you have the eyes between the cells, so that's why the cells are smaller. And that's also the reason why even the eyes in the circulation or between the cells, that's uh, quite much problem in almost all the animals. But still we have animals that are tolerating the overwintering. We have five different strategies. We have sneezes or the animals that are just trusting on the good luck. Like, like the housefly. They can't tolerate even minus 5 degrees of Celsius, so they must avoid the conditions where the temperature is freezing. So they must be under co uh, uh, snow cover, they must be inside the human houses, or whatever kind of shelter they exist. They can't tolerate chilling or freezing at all. Then we have snow whites, Animals that are tolerating minus 10 degrees of Celsius, they can tolerate long, uh, short period of uh, m uh, freezing temperatures, but not long time. And a red firebug is an example of this. Then we have these kind of dogs that are tolerating well cumulative chilling, so long time living in temperatures where it's below zero. And among these, there are several examples that are common over here, for example, in Finland. And for them, the lethal temperature is about minus 30 degrees of Celsius. And then we have two uh, exotic groups, crumpies, like golden grot gallfly, that is tolerating also the freezing so at least eyes between the cells. And in that case, the lethal temperature is minus 70, perhaps. And then we have happies that are tolerating also very long time in cold temperatures or of chilling uh, or freezing temperatures. So like Arctic beetle or Alpine cockroach. So these two last groups, they can tolerate pretty much all the temperatures on this planet. And how these insects and other invertebrates can do it. The idea is that, okay, you can get the supercooling point colder by adding any kind of solvent. And that's very common, for example, for everybody who has had a car in Arctic areas. You are adding some uh, solvents in, in, the, in, the, in the water to, so you can wash the windows. So you add any high concentration of any water soluble particles to lower, lower the freezing point. And so it's colligative phenomena. It doesn't matter what you are adding there. And then we can compare the freezing point, meaning the supercooling point and the composition of body fluids and how much there exists. So what is the osmolality? And we learned that, okay, in humans, we have about 300 milliosm. And we have some animals that are, have, are having 1,000 or 2,000 milliosm. So they have much more stuff in their uh, body fluids. And that will cause that, okay, they will freeze in minus 20 degrees of Celsius. And these are called freeze-avoiding insects. And they have pretty much the same kind of uh, supercooling point as, for example, different concentrations of glycerol solutions. But if you take these insects at summertime, 
they have less stuff inside the body fluid, so the osmolality is lower, and also the supercooling point, the freezing point, is, is also uh, less extreme. So they have something in their body fluids only in the winter. And then we have another group of animals that also are frozen in the summertime at minus 10 degrees of Celsius, but they are frozen in wintertime already at minus 5. So these are freeze-tolerant insects. They try to get frozen for the winter. So you have two kinds of strategies. You either tolerate the freezing or avoid it. And the idea is that, okay, you have some ice nucleating agents that are initiating the ice formation, for example, at minus 5 degrees of Celsius. Or you have, are trying to remove all these nucleating agents in your body fluids. Then, in both groups, they have polyols, polyhydroxyl alcohols, and sugars to lower the supercooling point, or to keep part of the solutions not frozen. So they either protect the partly unfrozen tissues, so the tissues that are not yet frozen, they are protecting them with these polyols, or they can increase the supercooling capacity, so to put the supercooling point on lower temperatures in the whole animal. And then they might have antifreezing proteins that are pretty much doing the same as these polyols and sugars, but they are doing it a little bit differently. So when you have freezing, you will get some ice crystals. They are very small, but they will be modulated by this recrystallization. And that's where the ice antifreeze proteins are working they are inhibiting this secondary recrystallization that is forming larger ice crystals, etc. And then they are also stabilizing this supercooling state. So even although the temperature is in the supercooled state of, of, of the solution, there will not be these large ice crystals that could froze the whole animal. But depending on the tolerance or avoidance, it will affect okay what kind of temperatures you can uh, tolerate and what is the mortality. So animals that are freeze tolerant, they can easily tolerate minus 40 degrees of Celsius. So pretty much everything that we have in Finland. And even then, they have during the winter time quite low mortality in the population. But then we have these freeze avoidance animals. They can tolerate maybe, maybe minus 20 degrees of Celsius. So if it's get colder than then that, they can quite easily have, for example, in Finland, quite high number of, of the air uh, in the population will die in the winter time. So that's why usually animals that are having this freeze avoidance, they are still trying to escape from the extreme. So, so they are seeking for some places where the temperature will not be so extreme. But sometimes it's difficult to hide. Like these barnacles, they are glued on the stone. So they can't escape, they can't migrate to the warmer climate for the winter. So they must tolerate the cold season, either by freezing or avoiding the freezing. And how we can do it? We have these antifreezers in, in super, sugar metabolites. And some of them we already discussed. We have these non-toxic polyols like glycerol and sorbitol. And as you can see, there are several hydroxyl groups, so that's why they are uh, these kind of polyalcohols. And they remind that, okay, they are not so far from <coughs> glucose metabolites. And these are quite common, for example, in Finland, in, 
in win overwintering insects, for example. They can have 20% or even 30% of the body mass can be sorbitol or glycerol. Or, for example, in common springstone, that very typical yellow uh, butterfly that is early bird in the, in the, in the uh, uh, springtime, so it's wintering as an adult, so it has maybe 4% of the body mass is glycerol. So that's why the uh, number of different kind of particles there in the, in the blood, it can be even 3,000 osm, a milliosm. So it's, it's 10 times higher concentration of different particles in the, in the blood, body fluids than in humans. And they can also be used in, in the frogs. So in some frogs, they have 400 millimole per liter of these polyols. Then, to get it a little bit even more simple, you can use glucose. Because glucose is water-soluble uh, particle, and adding a lot of glucose in, in the circulation, okay, it, you will reduce the, uh, or, or get, get, the, get the freezing point lower. But the problem is that, okay, it's harmful. We all know it. And that's why we have the insulin, etc., to, to keep the glucose levels low. But some animals can take it. But usually, even then, they are used in larger animals and at the time when there's already some ice inside the animal. So some frogs are having 300 millimole of glucose in their uh, circulation. And in, for example, in human, maybe 10. So it's, it's uh, way more than it should tolerate. But it's using it only when there's ice already inside the animal. How we can synthesize these polyols? We have glucose and then we have energy metabolism. And there is a one step that having this dehydroxyacetone phosphate that can be produced to glycerol. And the synthesis of glycerol from this dehydroacetone phosphate, there you need only NADH and, and, and then you remove some phosphate. But to produce the glycerol from the glucose, you need some ATP. And that's why you need a lot of energy to produce the glycerol. And that's why you produce the glycerol already in the fall the met uh, energy metabolic rates are working quite fast. Then we can go from the glucose on the opposite direction, remove the phosphate and uh, add some NADPH to produce sorbitol. And this synthesis, you don't need any ATP. So that's why it's easier to produce. You don't need so much energy yet, and it can be produced throughout the winter. And then, if we look on the catabolism, the glycerol can be used again in the energy production. But the problem is that the first thing that you need is ATP and glycerol kinase. So you are using ATP when you are putting the glycerol back to uh, glycolytic pathways. And that's why the animals are inactivating this glycerol kinase for the winter. So they produce the glycerol early in the fall, then they remove the glycerol from the body late in the spring. But then in the sorbitol way, you are just using NADH again to form fructose. Then from fructose you can produce it to other sugars. So you don't need ATP for these, uh, these con uh, converters and, and catabolism. So that's why the sorbitol and fructose concentrations can vary even in the midwinter. So you have, for example, quite high concentration of glu glu glycerol all around the winter. And then during the cold, very cold season, you add some sorbitol or fructose. So there can be annual cycles. And this is a quite nice, very old experiment. So overwintering animals, they have high gly glycogen levels in the fall, over here you can see, and then 
For example, this Golden God Gallfly, it's producing glycerol already in o October, when there's a lot of energy and the energy production of soil is effective, so all the processes are quite fast. And then, later on, in November, all the way November and February, you, it has this sorbitol, because it can be produced without the ATP. Because in freezing temperatures, the all energy production is anyways very slow. Then, we can have different triggers for this polyol production. We already saw that, okay, in the uh, previous one, okay, one polyol was produced in early in the fall, and then the other one was produced at the winter time, but we can have different triggers. First of all, the development state can affect. So, it's produced only in, in the larvas that are overwintering. Or there can be hormonal control. There can be some hormones that are affecting on the polyol synthesis. And then we can have different kind of triggers. So photoperiod, temperature, humidity, uh, are affecting all together. Then it can affect, okay, do we have food and do we have water? So when the water content is dropping, that will affect that, okay, it will feel that, okay, feels like dehydration, and that's why it's increased now the polyols. Or then in these larger animals like frogs, they are waiting until they will ice. So they start the synthesis when there will be ice in the frogs. Thank you.